Good, so hello and welcome to our third PhD Discuss live webinar. Today's topic is what makes a PhD successful? So first off, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, whether you are a new or a returning participant, we are delighted to have you along. So just to introduce ourselves and let you know what we're about, PH Discuss was created by three PhD students from the Centre for Doctoral Training course in Advanced Biomedical Materials at the Universities of Manchester and Sheffield, Leona Ogeni, Davide Berdolino and myself, Robert Bagley. The aim of this webinar series is to create a comfortable and open environment to discuss sensitive topics related to equality, diversity and inclusion, which may affect PhD students during their doctorate, and also to provide practical advice and ideas on how to tackle these issues. We have a diverse panel of researchers with us today to share their personal and thought-provoking experiences from their academic journeys. They will be discussing their relationship with success. Before I introduce them, here are some quick housekeeping points. If you have not done so already, please remember to mute your lines and turn off your camera. We also ask that you hide non-video participants, so only our panellists are visible during the in-panel discussion portion of the webinar. If you click on video at the bottom toolbar and go to video settings and scroll and tick hide non-video participants. Lastly, by selecting gallery view, you will be able to have a clear view of all of the panellists. We'll spend most of our time in the discussion portion, moderated by Davide. That will take us about up to the hour mark, but there'll be opportunities for audience participation in the form of polls during the discussion and a Q&A session at the end, led by Leona. We encourage you to use the chat box to send your questions or comments to us, which will be answered in the Q&A. If you want to anonymize your comment, you can remove your name. Please note that the chat box will only be available once we reach the Q&A session. One final note is that this webinar is being recorded for on-demand viewing. With that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel of four speakers today. Firstly, we have Professor Sarah Carnell. Sarah's interdisciplinary research area focuses on creating a paradigm shift in healthcare treatments. Her research is in the area of orthopaedic tissue engineering, wound care treatments, and more recently, translating the 3D tissue growth techniques to cancer research for early biomarker detection. Her research involves developing biomaterials and stimuli such as mechanical or electrical stimulation regimes to grow bone, cartilage, tendon, and ligament tissue in the lab with the aim of potentially implanting these tissues into a patient. In order to assess the quality of the tissues, she also develops X-ray imaging techniques for dynamic soft tissues or live cell imaging. She is currently head of the Department of Materials, which is home to nearly 2,000 students and staff, and is director of the EPSRC Centre for Doctoral Training for Advanced Biomedical Materials. Our second panellist is Dr. Rosemary Goff. Rosie was awarded her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Kent in 2019. During her doctorate, she developed a particular interest in how cell adhesion complexes regulate cell cycle progression. Rosie then moved to her current position in the Tozlan lab, where she is exploring the role of myosin type 6 in cancer using her biochemical expertise combined with advanced imaging techniques such as super resolution microscopy. Thirdly, we have Dr. Alison Harvey. After completing a PhD in peptide-based biosensors at the University of Manchester, Alison worked for a few years as a PDRA in various research groups. She then took a career break while having children and is currently in a role as a teaching and scholarship lecturer in the area of advanced biomedical materials, a role which allows her to combine her interest in biomaterials with her passion for encouraging students to fulfill their potential. And last but by no means least, Rita. Anne is a fully funded PhD candidate in economics at the University of Sheffield and currently works as a health economist at Bresmed. Her research interests include individual well-being and state of preferences. Besides her PhD project, Anne has worked as an associate lecturer and GTA at Sheffield Hallam University, the University of Sheffield and Sheffield International College. Being recognized as a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy 
in her third year PhD and is now joining the learning and teaching professional recognition scheme at the University of Sheffield as a Fellowship of Higher Education Academy Assessor. Welcome to Sarah, Alison, Rosemary and Anne. I shall now hand over to Davide, who will be moderating the panel in this discussion. Thank you, Davide. Hello, Rob, and thank you. Um, can we ask Alison? Have we lost Alison? Oh. Hello. So um, thanks, Rob, and hello, everyone. Um, so what makes uh, a PhD successful? For many of us, uh, the idea is linked uh, to producing new outstanding data, publishing first total papers, uh, or receiving accolades for academic success. But is this only true for everyone? Success is defined as the accomplishment of a name or purpose. All of us choose to embark on, a, on our PhD journeys for different reasons, coming from different backgrounds, and also looking for different plans for the future, all of which will inevitably shape our aims and purpose for completing a PhD. With many students suffering from burnout, trying to make the standardized definition of successful PhD, today we come together to broaden this perspective and encourage students to look inwards and develop their own genuine ideas of success. So for those of you who already attended one of our webinars, uh, we uh, like to start with a poll just to uh, include the audience. Um, and this should be popping, on your, uh, popping up on your screen now. Yes, so the first poll question is, do you think your PhD has been successful so far? We'll just leave it there for a few minutes and let's start hearing from our panelists. For, uh, so hello panelists, let's jump right in with today's topic. So how do you define success in a PhD? Sarah, would you like to uh, start us off? Thank you, Davide, and thank you to all of the organisers for this event. It's a really exciting, not only topic, but um, series of discussions that you're holding. So thank you ever so much for your time and effort with this. Um, I, say, I agree with your opening statement, Davide. I think there are generic success metrics that one would think of that would define success of a PhD. Um, just to recap those, I think you've already mentioned a lot of them. Obvious, obvious metrics include completing your thesis and the viva being awarded the PhD, obviously, because that's the whole purpose I think all of us have in common when they start the PhD. Other metrics include publication of high quality journal articles, presentations, oral and poster at conferences and patent outputs. Others include awards, as you'd mentioned. These may be short-term grant placements that you've independently applied for and been awarded, or awards for best presentation or other competitions that you went to join your PhD, such as entrepreneurship or outreach engagement awards. Other success outputs could be building your research network, such as national, international, academic, industrial, policy, decision makers, etc. And at the end of your PhD, you should have a good idea of your next career steps as well. In addition to this, I think success can mean many things to different people, and it's important that the student can be aware of their own internal mission statement and refer back to this as a gauge of their success. For example, some people are motivated by money. Uh, for example, a successful PhD could lead to a well-paid job, and maybe that's that particular student's idea of success, and that could offer them security and stability if that's what it represents. Others may be motivated by, I don't know, a flexible lifestyle or by researching important areas such as healthcare or climate change that has a large positive impact on others. I'll pass over, I think, maybe to one of the other speakers. Yes, so um, everything Sarah mentioned there, again, I agree with and I'll sort of reiterate in my answer a little bit as well. So I think when I started out in my PhD, I perhaps had a limited knowledge of what academia was. Um, and on reflection, I was probably quite naive to the PhD process as a whole. So my perception of what success was in academia was formed through listening to other researchers, academics and my peers. And to me at the beginning, the message was quite clear. Success was built on your research output and how much you published. And I remember hearing time and time again, this time old phrase, publish or perish. Um, which at the beginning, this can make it quite stressful and almost frustrating as you're going through. Um, but I think as my PhD went through, I changed my, um, my idea of what success was. And I started to look at the other um, 
other markers and indicators that Sarah and Davide have already mentioned, um, setting myself up for what I wanted my next job to be, gaining soft skills, um, gaining in confidence in my research project as a whole, um, and trying to present at different conferences and stuff. And I think that having all of those qualities together um, can help define your PhD as being a success or not just not just based on your papers that you publish. Thank you both. Um, and as the only panel is still doing their PhD, um, how will you define success in a PhD? I guess I'm coming from a later um, generations to PhD. So my perception to start with was already different. So when I started, there's an emphasis on the um, personal development. So for me, it's more like how I manage my thesis, how I meet all the deadlines that I have, how I reach my goals, rather than looking into um, how many applications I have. I know that there's a lot of emphasis on that for PhD students, but because I think it's um, my generation is a little bit different when they a lot of um, impressions from like people from different background may end up with different um, career route, different um, kind of, for me, it's more like how I develop myself and how I reach and achieve my own goal. That is the definition of success to me. Thank you, Alison. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction that you took uh, a career break. So how did you define success during your PhD? And did that definition influence your decision to take a break? Uh, and how did this shape, uh, how else did this shape your journey through academia? I know a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of questions in one there. Um, so I think um, during my PhD, I'm not sure I ever actually sat down and listed criteria for success in a PhD, but obviously looking back on it now, I can see that you naturally pick up this impression, right? Which everybody else has already listed. So publish, the more the better, um, present at conferences, submit your thesis on time, know the subject well enough to be able to discuss it comfortably so that you can um, do well in your viva. And so that's a satisfying experience. And then I would say there was another one for me was that I felt um, if I was successful in my PhD, I should be able to carry on in academia. So I should be able to get that first postdoc and I should be able to carry on. Um, and I think actually that's not necessarily a very healthy attitude to have. I do think it's important that you look ahead to what you want to do afterwards. So you aim your goals towards that. But if you're listing criteria, I think you should think what you want to have achieved by the end so that you can feel like you've succeeded when you get to the end. Um, and the reason I say that is going on to your question about my journey in academia. Um, I was unfortunate to have a year during my academic experience of working in a group that had a very um, negative environment, um, which was very much just focused on results and publications at the expense of absolutely anything else. Um, mental well-being, personal development, it was all out the window apart from doing what the boss wanted. Um, and it was a horrible experience. It was soul destroying and it made me hate academia and I left for a while, um, but came back and uh, worked with some lovely academics who helped me regain my passion for the science. <laughs> and I realized that I really enjoyed the teaching. Um, and what I discovered in that was um, that recovering from that experience was harder because I had this idea that my success in my PhD was tied up with success in academia afterwards. And academia is hard, so it is really hard and at times very nasty. So I think it's a good idea to keep that, what you succeed at in your PhD as defined within your PhD. Um, as for the career break, um, I mean, your, your journey through academia influences those decisions. It's complicated and personal. Um, but what I would say was, at the time of deciding to take a career break, I realized that my PhD in itself was um, very important to me. And even if I never set foot in academia again, it was something I was pleased to have done. And I got a lot out of it in terms of personal growth, in terms of skills that you can take elsewhere. Um, 
And I think that that's an important thing to remember um, when you're thinking about what you class as success. Thank you. So we touched on uh, um, many points, uh, very important points uh, uh, with our first question. One uh, that I think resonates uh, with me a lot is that everyone has their own idea of success and uh, um, everyone needs to, first of all, understand that before um, kind of uh, stressing about uh, the PhD itself. Uh, and uh, uh, something very important thing for me is that um, the definition of success that I'm said that it's uh, rather how much you grow in the process uh, rather than the end results uh, themselves. Uh, so we'll, uh, uh, shall reveal the results of our first poll now. Um, yes, perfect. Uh, so we have uh, almost uh, a 50-50 um, split in the audience. So 57% uh, think that their uh, PhD has been successful so far, and 43% think that um, it has not been. So in, uh, I think we have uh, um, more than 100 uh, um, uh, audience members today, and it's quite um, an interesting aspect uh, that Alphabet thinks that it's been successful. It will be interesting seeing how far in the PhD the one that said, answered yes uh, are. So let's keep this discussion going. Uh, panelists, for those of you who have completed your PhD, has your initial perception of success uh, from when you started it changed since uh, completing it? Should we begin with elephant this time, since you uh, touched on this earlier? Um, yes, in some ways. I think that the goals are still important. I think you do need to publish, you do need to present at conferences, all those things matter. Um, I think that you should add in some element of what you want to get out of it personally um, for yourself, because every student's individual. Um, we all have different qualities and strengths Everyone has a different project, so you all have different challenges and you all have different desires and, and needs for the future. So I think it has to be tailored individually to what you want. I guess just to pick up on that, if I may, Davide, yeah, um, I, I think uh, I think Robert introduced me earlier and, and just to remind people, I, I, I'm now a professor, so it's been over 20 years since I completed my PhD. And so my own success values have broadly stayed the same. So my, when I said individually our success values are different, my personal ones would be a wish to help others, um, to be approachable, um, to do excellent science, to make a difference, um, to have autonomy. Um, I've seen, so money's never been a motivator, for example, right, right at the start, but I have seen, not that it's a, a major motivator now, but I have seen a difference in that as I've got older. Um, so, you know, as long as I've, me personally, as long as I've got enough money to, to eat and have a bed, you know, and roof over my head, that's fine. But since I've had more responsibility, since I've had children and since my own, you know, I've seen, you know, as my, my mother's passed away now, but as I've seen how much costs, you know, as you get older, the elderly care costs. I've thought a little bit more about maybe I should invest a bit more into my pension. So that money motivation is never going to be a driver for me, but I've thought about that more. It's more important as I've got older. That's the only thing that's really changed. Um, I would say that when I was doing my PhD, you know, if I see, have I seen it successful? You know, when I did the poll, I, I entered that and I said, yes. And I think your comments the other day was quite interesting. And it would be interesting to see whether or not people are not seeing that their, their PhD has actually been successful, whether or not they just have not realised that success yet. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, you know, when I was doing my PhD in Liverpool, um, I did my 96 to 99, and um, I had a, a letter that I always wanted to be in an academic track. And I, knew, kind of knew, I always reviewed it as I went through my career, but I, knew, I did know I, I wanted to take an academic track. And um, I had a letter that was wrongly addressed to me. It was to me, but it, it said Professor Sarah Cartman. I remember being in the pigeonhole and coming out and um, a few people had seen that. Some of the, the admin staff had seen it. And they went, ah, 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 look at Sarah. She always says it's, she's a professor. And I went, oh, yes, isn't that funny, you know? And how ridiculous, you know? And I remember seeing that at the time, but I did look down and I saw and I thought, Do you know, that's not so ridiculous. And that's what I want to do. 
And that's why, you know, when I clicked yes, I thought, well, yes, because that PhD for me was a training, but also a stepping stone for that academic career trajectory. So um, if anybody else wants to uh, come in from the panel. Um, yes, as I, I touched on my answer a little bit before, my perception of success has changed as I've progressed through my PhD and I'm now still in academia. I think um, it's really important, Sarah mentioned about sometimes you might not realise that your PhD is a success. So I think remembering to celebrate your successes, no matter how small they are, is really, really important. Um, and that's something that I definitely try to do more now, whether that's a publication, presenting at a conference, trying something new that's out of your comfort zone, doing something like this perhaps, <laughs> and taking as many different opportunities as you can. I think it's really important to, um, yeah, celebrate those successes and um, set yourself goals that you can attain to help yourself continue, to have that continued feeling of success. Thank you. And what about you? I say change from, uh, because considering you're still doing it in these three years, uh, if I'm not mistaken, four almost now, uh, has it changed uh, since you started? No, for me, I haven't changed since I started. I guess it could be because I just started. It's only four years. Yeah. It's quite a short time, but uh, since the very beginning, is always about how I develop myself. Because I, I didn't have a like impression that I have to stay in academia. Mm -hmm. I have I, I just feel like I can be open to anything, any interesting opportunities that I could apply my PhD and the skill I learned from my PhD. So so far, and and to be honest, I actually I'm not working in academia right now. I'm a career change and working for consultancy from the moment. I really enjoy it. The best thing is what I have learned in my PhD and all the skill and how I can work independently, that helped me a lot. One thing I could like to ask is, you know, just like everyone saying we should set our own goal and try for it and celebrate every success that we can reach. It's not, it, don't wait until the end and just realize, oh, I just finished my PhD. You, you just have to just stop and look at what you have done because it, if it's that for me, I haven't finished, then I shouldn't call it a success if that's the perception. But yeah, I think yes in the poll. I believe that I have been successful in my PhD, even though I still have some months to go. But yeah, that's the, the, the important thing. You need to really acknowledge what you have done and celebrate yourself. Thank you. So um, yes, uh, uh, we touched I think one of the important um, key message uh, from this uh, like question uh, is, uh, uh, first of all, that success, the idea of success can change because of course, uh, when you uh, grow up, uh, you have different um, requirements uh, or different uh, uh, needs uh, that uh, pop up. And also I think uh, the most important one is uh, that you should learn how to celebrate even those small uh, successes during your PhD, that it can be uh, like Rosie, the example that Rosie uh, gave, like you're publishing your first paper um, or even like an experiment goes well. Uh, um, those small successes really, I think are important uh, and uh, um, to keep you going as well uh, during your PhD. Um, Okay, so just talking uh, uh, in what you have all said about your individual success criteria and how these have changed and evolved, uh, has made me wonder what is the best memory of your PhD um, and was it connected to the idea of uh, success that you've just mentioned? Would you like me to? Am I in? Yeah. You want to keep <laughs> Yeah. Um, I would say there's lots of great memories for when I did my PhD um, getting my own data was very exciting um, coming up with my own research plan. I really enjoyed um, I really enjoyed traveling and I still do when we can. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> campuses, building networks, meeting people, different people from all walks of life. Um, I love disseminating my work in, in publications and at meetings. I loved working with industry. So my PhD was a case um, industry sponsored PhD. 
and see my work translated and making a difference. Um, I love the team and the camaraderie within the research group I was in. Um, and I actually enjoyed writing up, um, even though everyone told me this was going to be the really worst bit. And I got to the end and I was like, I actually really liked that. I was, I was waiting for this terrible, like, oh my God, I, I hate this. And, it, and that never happened. And then relating back to what I'd said to my own ideas of success. And I think that very much was, you know, my, as I mentioned, you know, wish to help others, be approachable, direct some science, make a difference, have autonomy. All of that, I think, was, was why I enjoyed it. And I saw it was a success. Um, one of the best memories from my PhD that I can remember is that I got to go and spend a month working with a collaborating group. Uh, it was actually at the University of Manchester and it, uh, I was going to learn a new technique and so I'd been doing a biochemistry PhD and the group worked more in cell biology and imaging and I remember I went over and they asked me for my advice on um, a biochemistry question and I sort of remember looking at them like why are you asking me? I'm a PhD student, you're a postdoc. Um, and he was like, well, no, this is what you work on. This is sort of like, you're almost like an expert in your field. And I just remember that gave me this feeling. I, just, I felt great, I felt really confident and that I could talk about my, um, my work. And I think that that does connect to my idea of success, having confidence um, to build on what you're doing, to be able to take the next step forward. So yes, that was one of the best memories I had in my PhD. It's really nice to hear people's nice memories and you can see how much people enjoy it, can't you? Um, I have several fond memories from my PhD. Um, I always enjoyed talking about science with my supervisor. Um, I enjoyed working with the people in my group. Um, we had a very good sort of relationship between everybody. Um, probably one of my favourite sort of moments to pull out was when I went to a big conference in the US, um, I think it was in my third year, and I had a poster and the two top guys like in the field came and spoke to me about my work on my poster for five minutes and it was just really nice to um, have that kind of acknowledgement from somebody that you, you know, you read all their work and you think really highly of, so that was, that's probably my favourite moment. <laughs> it's really nice to hear about everyone's favourite moment. And I can see a lot of my memories from Sarah's answer, all the memories from going to conferences, writing up, and all these, you know, related with PhD things. But for me, now that it's really fresh, my best memory so far was last year conference that I went with my supervisor. That was the first one I went with her. And it was so surprised for me that she literally brought me and introduced me to everyone there and show everyone how proud she is having me as a student. I could never, really never thought of that, like, you know, my supervisor could do that, like introduce me and show how much she enjoy working with me. And it's never about, you know, how far I am with my PhD, whether I'm finished early or, you know, how, if I have any publications, she never mentioned these things, but it was like how I managed to work part-time along my PhD full-time and how much enjoy, how much enjoyable she has felt working with me and talking about research. That is the best memory so far for me. I feel really confident that someone who worked really close to me acknowledged my effort and at some point I realized that people look at me and, and can see how successful I am with my work, something that Sometimes I don't realize. I just see like, okay, I'm in my third year, I've done three chapters, but I cannot really see outside of that. Like beside the chapter, how far I can look at what I have done. And that was really, really nice. Thank you all. Uh, I, I mean, it's very nice hearing uh, nice memories about the PhD and it makes me excited about the um, years to come the years I have left uh, in my own uh, uh, PhD. And also it makes me excited for when I'll be able to join a conference in person after this two first year of uh, COVID. But um, yeah, I think one of the themes uh, um, like amongst the four of you is that uh, a lot of the memories uh, is connected to positive uh, uh, affirmation and reinforcement from uh, people uh, that 
um, you have around. So like someone important, like a supervisor in the case of Anne or like even a postdoc for Rosie, it just like gives you um, that kind of external point of view that makes you realize that you actually um, are successful, that you actually are doing uh, uh, what you can do and you're doing it well. Um, so thank you for sharing your memory, first of all. And uh, uh, before we move on to our next discussion point, uh, let's open our second poll for the audience. Uh, the question is, uh, how often do you set goals towards success uh, in your PhD? Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll go on with our discussion. So uh, we spent the majority of time so far defining success. So I think uh, it, it will be useful for our audience, which predominantly consists of PhD students, uh, to discuss some of the false ideas uh, of success that we pick up uh, during our studies. Uh, so panelists, uh, what misconception uh, do you think students can have about success uh, in a PhD? Rosie, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So um, misconceptions, I think we could probably summarize um, misconceptions in one word. And that's the expectation with expectation, the expectation you have as a student when you start out your PhD and what you expect to be able to gain from your project and achieve in the time that you have. So I think when you go into a PhD, you presume that every PhD project will allow for the same opportunity, the same output, um, the same amount of papers. And this just isn't the case for so many reasons. So I think it's really important to not compare your, your individual progress too closely with your peers or perhaps um, other students in your lab. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably what the biggest, for me, what one of the biggest misconceptions was. And I know for many of my other peers as well. I agree with Rosie on that. One of the things I had down on my list was that you, people have a tendency to compare with others. And I think especially people that come to a PhD are generally very high achievers. So you've come through from an undergraduate degree where everyone's given the same information and everyone's assessed in the same way. And then you compare yourself naturally with everybody else. And that doesn't really work in a PhD because your projects are different and your, you know, the challenges that you come up against are different and your supervisor's different as well. So the way that you're led um, is going to be different depending on who you're working with. So I think it's it's a good idea not to compare with with how other people are doing. I totally agree. I did the same thing when I started. Because PhD itself doesn't have a clear, you know, a requirements to say, okay, I did this, then this is better than the others. It's only basically it's pass or fail. So it's just hard to really see whether it's a success. And I started comparing myself when I started looking at someone who finished in three years and like, I need to finish in three years to be like that person or seeing someone get a job offer immediately when they finish or even before their viva and thinking like, if I cannot do that, that probably mean that, that I fail. So that kind of thing was the thing that I, I feel a lot of pressure about when I started. And I think many people have that feeling because they hear a lot about, you need to get a job, you need to get a postdoc, you need to have many publications, you need to finish in three years with your scholarship, for example. That's kind of thing. I think that is, that are one of the misconceptions that, misconceptions that people have when they started. I would agree with, with all three of the panel members. Um, so an awareness that the students' paths are different is really important and they shouldn't be judged against each other. So, for example, a student might be gaining lots of data from short term 10 minute experiments and another might take months to get data. And so the resulting publication um, number or quality may be quite different. It doesn't mean that one student is more successful from another. I think also going back to what motivates that student, what their um, definition of success is and having an, an increased awareness that the students, that other people have different versions of success um, can really help others understand each other in, in, the, in the PhD group to understand their decision making and situations, viewpoints and their motivation. Because that's often a misconception people assume uh, that their definition of success is, is the same as each other. 
Yeah, totally. I I agree. Like uh, as a PhD student myself, I think uh, uh, comparison is a hard thing not to do. Uh, I think that's one of the things that you learn uh, uh, when you start your PhD. Uh, you should start learning when you do your undergrad, but I think you're still too young <laughs> and naive back then. Um, so leading on from uh, uh, the uh, previous question, I'd like to ask our panelists uh, whether they think students and supervisors' needs uh, must be aligned. And would you like to start first as your still a PhD student? Yes, um, those questions is something that I ask myself as well, because it could be naive to think that it's always the case that all that needs to be aligned. But it, it, it could be ideal to have that, but that not always happens. So I believe that at different times and in different situations, there's some priorities. There's, for example, it could be the student's mental health, at some point it could be, if for example, I'm at the end of my PhD now, then my supervisor may have, they, their uh, needs could be like, okay, we could have some publications out of the PhD, but for me, my priority is not there. For example, I've gone to finish my PhD, I want to maintain my mental health. So that is where there's differences between what the supervisor want and what the student want. And that is when communication is needed. So for me, honesty and communications are really, really important because you need to be honest to have to have the relationship to work. And yeah, that's what I think. Um, I agree with what Anne has said there. And again, one of the key words there is communication. I think where possible, if your student and supervisor relationship is aligned, um, I think it can ultimately lead to a more successful or a more enjoyable PhD. Um, the supervisor student relationship is like a symbiotic relationship and often in groups PhDs make up um, most of the workforce for a supervisor. So therefore, um, they, the supervisor wants you to be able to generate research and output in order to help them succeed themselves. So you're sort of feeding off each other's successes. And I think being able to be open and have clear communication with your supervisor about perhaps what you want to do in the future um, and what your goals are, then I think it can help your relationship and ultimately make a more successful PhD project. If I can come in, Davide, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just... Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with the, uh, the the comments. I think there needs to be, an, at the start of the PhD, there needs to be an agreement and a discussion of expectations. Um, and I think that needs to be viewed and, and ongoing. And um, I think about the students, the research that's been undertaken, but also the students' career goals, but also the supervisor's plan for the research outputs of the work. So the supervisors are also stakeholders in this project and their input shouldn't just be ignored. They should also be included as the student is actually an ambassador for the supervisor's research. Um, and that discussion about expectations should be reviewed and discussed as I mentioned during the PhD to ensure it's still fit for purpose because that may change. When I've spoken to undergraduate students that are wanting to do or considering doing a PhD, uh, the kind of the advice I would normally give is when I have seen people not complete their PhD, it's normally down to one of three things. So one of them would be their motivation for doing the PhD might not be right. So some people might want to do it because they want to be called doctor, which, you know, when you're in, you go in peaks and troughs, and actually when you're in one of those troughs of research and nothing's working, that normally isn't enough motivation to get you out your trough. Or some people do it because they've kind of fallen into it because they haven't really looked and they've been offered a position and they go, oh, why not? Everybody else is staying on. That's, again, not enough motivation. They have to want to do the PhD, so that motivation is important. The other thing in terms of, you, so say you've got your motivation, you want to do a PhD. The other thing is um, the project. So you have to be excited about the project topic. 
Um, so you could have the motivation to do it, but if you're really not excited about the actual work that you're doing, then, then that would make it very difficult to get you through those hard times as well. And then the third one I would say is a supervisor, and that comes back to your original question. So you do need, everybody's got different personalities. And, and I think Alison had mentioned this earlier in terms of, you know, you have it, sometimes that working environment that Alison had described before might, might be great for somebody else, but it wasn't for her at that time. Um, so an awareness of the, the group that you're joining and the supervisor and that communication and how they work is really important because even if you've got your motivation and your project right, if you haven't got that expectation and alignment with the supervisor, then that could, could be a tricky area. I completely agree with what you've just said, Sarah. Um, and I think, um, you know, naturally the students and supervisors needs should be aligned if you're on the same project and you're supposed to be working to promote that project together um, so I think it's it comes down to communication again so it hopefully you, you have a supervisor that you do get on with and and that you click with then I would always recommend that people work on that um, I think as a student when I started I was very shy and it took me quite a long time to get used to being able to speak honestly with my supervisor so I would encourage people to to try and um, speak up openly early on about what it is that your um, needs and wants are from your PhD so that you can align them with what your supervisor needs. Yeah, um, thank you all. I, I think I, I mean, I agree. I think one of the most important aspects of any, I think, uh, professional relationship, uh, if in uh, a PhD or not, is open communication, mostly like with your line manager that in our uh, in a PhD is our supervisor. So um, thank you for your point. Now let's take a look at the results from uh, uh, our second poll. Um, okay, so uh, we can see that most of the audience, uh, 52%, uh, uh, set their goals uh, uh, towards success monthly. Um, there are few, uh, very few, that never do it. Some do it daily, um, and then uh, uh, yearly we have 16% and weekly 23%. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, I don't know, from a, like, I don't know, from my perspective, sometimes monthly uh, seems such a, a short period of time. Um, it goes so fast during your PhD because you start your experiment and then it goes wrong. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's interesting seeing that. So uh, one of the things that we have all touched on is this pressure to publish the, and produce papers during the PhD. I know this is something that many PhD students struggle with. In some countries, it is actually a requirement to produce first uh, paper publications in order to complete the PhD. So I'd really uh, be interested uh, to hear from our panelists uh, whether they feel that there is too much pressure on PhD students to publish several papers during their PhD. Sarah, perhaps we could begin with you. Um, thank you. I guess it depends where the pressure is coming from. I think, as Alison mentioned before, in that particular lab, it sounded like there was too much pressure at the expense. So I'm not saying that one should have that much pressure at the expense of everything else. I don't believe that. However, it is really important and, and I think ethically, morally correct to be able to disseminate your research. You know, all the work that you're doing, I think it is right that we need to disseminate. Now you can disseminate that by other means, but I think to have a permanent traditional record is an obvious route. Um, and I think a good thing to, there will always be exceptions. So I wouldn't say as a blanket, absolutely, everybody has to do it, but I would say as a rule of thumb, it's a really good expectation it's also a metric that isn't going away anytime soon. So those wishing to pursue an academic career need to do need to fulfill it as a metric because that will be seen as a, as we said, when we're defining success, most people will see that. Now I appreciate that not everybody wants to pursue an academic route. There might be an industrial route or another route um, and that might be less important to their career and be competitive for their interview or, or that particular job. Or if you want to be an entrepreneur and set up your own job and be your own boss. Um, however, going back ethically, I think it's right to disseminate wherever possible and reach the audience you want to reach. Alison, do you want to go first? You go ahead, Anne, I'll follow. 
But I just want to jump in because uh, I'm, I just frankly applied a lot in my second year. And I have to say that there's a lot of uh, places, not only academia, but outside as for kind of publications or at least a working paper version, some kind of labor market paper where it's on some uh, working paper series. So I have to say that if we want to apply on a basis of a PhD, not like um, if you go for a graduate skin and no one's gonna ask you to have applications, but if you want to take advantage of your degree saying you apply with your PhD, you become more competitive, then that is a must. They will ask for something. It will be a must for every application that more research focus, let's say. So you go even going to an industry, but uh, for research focus um, positions, they will still ask you to, for example, for most of the positions I apply for, they ask for coding, which is typically economic stuff. I have to send them coding. I have to send them the link to the paper. So it's not the PDF file of my chapter. It has to be a paper on a public domain. So basically you need to get it out somehow. And the sooner the better, that's what I, I think. Yeah. Alison? Yeah, no. <laughs> I was just going to say um, the same, you know, we can talk about all the other things that are good to have with success in a PhD, but yes, you do need to publish. And as Sarah says, if you're getting results, then you should disseminate them. Um, it is important to publish. Um, and if you want a career in academia, you will need papers. That's, that's a fact. Um, I mean, there are other reasons too anyway. It feels good. <laughs> and your PhD is a really good time to practice writing papers because you've got a supervisor there that can help you learn the process and hold your hand when it goes wrong, <laughs> which it inevitably will at some point. Um, so I think, um, yeah, you do need to publish in your PhD. Um, I also think though that in some ways, and maybe this is going back to my own experience, of course, but um, if there's too much pressure to publish, well, your PhD is a time when you're supposed to be learning how to do the research yourself and how to make some decisions yourself um, and, and to make mistakes. So that's not necessarily the most efficient way to get results. So maybe there needs to be a bit of a balance, giving you a, a chance to, to make mistakes along the way as well. I don't know, maybe that's a controversial one. I'm not sure what Sarah would say about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I agree with everyone and um, what they said. I remember, well, I still do feel a lot of pressure to publish, not just in my PhD, but in academia. And I think it's interesting what Sarah said about where that pressure comes from. And I think most of the time that pressure always came from me, um, myself. So maybe if I had taken off some of that pressure, I would have found the whole experience a lot easier because um, at, as you're going through your PhD and you're getting results, you will always have something to publish, I'm sure. So maybe having such pressure on yourself isn't necessarily helpful. And like Alison was saying as well, it can sometimes detract from your project and the leads that you're taking, and it can almost stunt you. You feel like you have to take a certain path because that's where you think you're gonna get your paper from. And I think it's important to not always think like that, especially during your PhD where you're trying to learn. Um, but yeah, it would be naive to say that you can't publish or you don't need to publish. I think from what everybody's just said, I think it is an indicator that allows you to be judged against your peers when you're going for jobs and things like that. Yeah, thank you everyone. I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, um, I, I'm surprised on one side because I didn't know that uh, non-academia jobs uh, will uh, uh, ask for publication, if that makes sense. That was maybe me being naive. Um, but uh, I agree also that publication really uh, make you, um, make your writing uh, stronger. So even if you don't manage to, I don't know, publish in the, I don't know, first two years or whatever, I think uh, that experience, uh, uh, the whole process of uh, submitting a paper to a journal, uh, uh, having it checked uh, not only by your supervisor prior submission, but also um, by the reviewers uh, um, uh, from uh, the uh, editors. Uh, I think it's really important because it, it really gives you feedback uh, on your own uh, uh, way of writing. Uh, 
and uh, that will be useful uh, uh, when you write your own thesis. Uh, so um, I agree also with the fact that it really depends on where the pressure comes from. And uh, um, but again, uh, it should uh, if there is open communication with your supervisor. I think that pressure could easily be uh, dialed down by simply uh, bringing the issue um, to your supervisor. So uh, time for our last poll. Uh, so the question is, do you feel it is possible to have a, a healthy work-life balance uh, and still achieve uh, your idea of success? Um, you should see the poll up. Did it come up? Sorry, uh, oh, no. It was the wrong poll, I think the... Okay, oh, now there's the correct one. Um, okay, so uh, at PhD Discuss, uh, we always like to provide our audience uh, with practical advice uh, that they can take away and implement uh, in their own work. So one thing that was uh, highlighted during this webinar is this individual gauge for success uh, and personal success criteria, which each of our panelists uh, has shaped for themselves. Uh, so for our closing questions, panelists, uh, how can uh, students realize their own uh, genuine ideas uh, of success? Uh, who would like to start? Can I, can I start, Davide? Yeah, so, of course. Um, so I think it goes back to reflecting and, and you really do, do need to have a plan of what your idea of success is. So even if you haven't necessarily got a career trajectory, you can still be open with that. I think by the time you're doing a PhD, you probably should have a bit of an idea of where you want to go, to be fair. But you, it doesn't mean you're completely tied in. OK, so it's not I'm not saying don't panic. You know, I'm, I'm saying don't panic if you haven't got that, but normally you would expect to have a bit of a, an idea of where you want to go and why you're doing a PhD. And then one should think about that career path, what, what they want post PhD and ensure that they're gaining the right skills during the PhD in order to be competitive for that position. So if somebody knows that they really want to be engaged in policy decision making, you know, and in, in five years time, you have an opportunity within your PhD to look at secondments or, you know, there's the, it's not just about just doing the research, you've got opportunities then you need to open that dialogue up with the supervisor about that and say this is something that I'm really interested in. So we can't take over, you can't change the whole PhD topic, but you can get the skills during your PhD in order to make you more competitive for that position. So yes, so I think students should just keep engaging with their supervisor, but also look to establish mentors who can help guide them. Um, students can constantly reflect and review where they are relative to those skills that they've defined that they need to put them in the right position to be competitive um, and that trajectory to ensure they're on the right track. I myself always, always, I still do look for mentors and I normally, you know, when I was doing a PhD, there's, there's postdocs in the route that I constantly went to and said, you know, how do you do this? And because sometimes your supervisor, as I say, you know, I'm 20, 20 years on from my PhD, so I can give guidance, but I might not be, you know, I'm normally looking to somebody five or 10 years just above me so that you can see how that works. And um, so I would really look for mentors and in different areas and, and see what works for you. I, totally I agree, agree with Sarah. Oh, sorry, Anne. <laughs> Go ahead, Alison. It's your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, I agree with Sarah. All of those things sound um, like like good ways to success. Um, I would say identify what you enjoy doing in your PhD, and particularly if you're not quite sure about what you want afterwards, then that might help you. Um, you know, if there's some bit of it that you particularly love the lab work or you particularly love the writing or the presenting, um, that might help you. Um, figure out what bits scare you or what bits you find really challenging and get advice on those. Um, identify what success means for you and so what you want to do afterwards, what, um, what steps will get you what you want and break it down. Um, communicate, which has come up so many times. So like Sarah said, not just with your supervisor, um, but find mentors and speak to your peers and anyone um, that might have the, the knowledge to help you. Um, make good choices on how you spend your time because um, you can get very, very busy and you can get bogged down in certain parts and not see other bits. Um, so make tiny good sort of choices and be aware of what choices you're making um, and celebrate all the successes which I think Rosie said earlier so don't don't um 
let these things pass without celebrating them on the way. You know, every time you do something good, if you present at a conference or if you give a poster or if you get a paper um, submitted and, and accepted, make sure you celebrate it and write it down and enjoy the process because it will be over before you know it. <laughs> Yes, I totally agree with that celebration. Yes, I do that every... Well, that reminds me of the poll, asking how often do I plan for things or look at you know, my goal and success. I choose yearly, but I actually do it every six months. So every six months, I pick a day, sit down, have a list of what I have done so far, and have a plan for what I want to do in, in the next six months. So planning, like Sarah said, is very important because your plan will change over the time, but you need to realize as soon as possible and have a, a good plan to achieve what you want. Personally, I, I did that a lot in my first year too often. Then I realized that it may be, you know, like weekly or monthly, maybe too much. But I think uh, a good six months is uh, quite, quite okay, at least for me. So a very brief example was in my first year, I was in, like, I was advised to go to a session of, like, a lot of workshops in teaching, and it would lead to an uh, associate fellowship in teaching uh, at higher education, which is very important if anyone wants to become a lecturer or want to have a career in, in teaching. So I went there, and obviously, I, I didn't have any experience in teaching at university at that time. And I was advised to go for an associate fellow, which is that you don't need to have that much experience. You need to learn and show that you can reflect on what you learn and apply it into teaching. I was there for some months at the university and starting to apply for job teaching uh, or you know, teaching assistance or just prepare for labs and realized I could do more than that. I take some I started planning, okay, if I want to do a bit more of teaching, wait for my second year or third year, I could apply for a fellowship. Which is, I think in many universities now it's become the criteria to pass probations for, for teaching jobs. And by the time I reach my halfway through my third year, I really like, okay, um, I still have more than a year. So I'm planning to do four-year PhDs. So by that time I was like, okay, I have more than four years and I already have two year experience. And I seek for help from mentor. I went and asked people how they did their fellowship application, what I need to go to get further, to get higher than just fellowship. It's a bit stretching, to be honest, but I have a plan and I think that maybe I should try and who knows. And I actually did it. I had a mentor at uh, Sheffield Harlem University and he told me what the difference between the senior fellow and the fellow and helped me to have the plan, what other points that I need to do, then I applied to become a master of supervisors, start with at a secondary supervisors and then become the first one. And that gave me the experience for me to apply for a higher fellowship. Also joining all the other activities for training for staff, providing mentorship as well. So I started as a mentee and then um, I volunteered to become a mentor. That All that things built up. And in the end, I, I got the senior fellow, which I think for me is a, a really big success for my PhD. And I think that, that all that thing um, from Alison or Sarah, all that planning, success, um, celebrate your success is very important for not only students, but for all of us to realize the idea of success. Yes, um, I think similar things too. Um, if you can have an idea of what you want to do after your PhD, I think that helps. For me, that changed multiple times as I was going along. Um, if you can look at job adverts and get an idea of the skill sets that you need. But during your PhD, you'll find there are so many opportunities if you look to do different things, whether that's outreach, um, working with other labs, collaborations, um, so many different opportunities. And the more of those that you can grab hold of and take, the more you've got to add to your CV, the more you'll stand out compared to other people that you're applying for jobs and the more confidence and skills you'll gain along the way and I think that can definitely help you build your idea of success as you're going along perhaps things aren't going well in the labs or going well in the PhD so having these other things outside can give you little boosts and um, that you need to help pick you up when you're having not such a good day or not such a good month um, and yes celebrate as you go along 
find other PhD students to celebrate with. Um, and yeah, I think that's the best advice I can give. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll uh, uh, look at the polls answer now. Uh, it should come up, yes. So uh, as you can see, the majority, so 72%, uh, feel that it is possible to achieve a work-life balance uh, and still achieve your idea of a successful PhD. Um, it will be interesting seeing uh, if they feel that they achieved it so far, if that makes sense. Uh, um, but um, that brings us to uh, the end of our panel discussion. A massive thank you to uh, all of our panelists for sharing your experiences. We uh, touched how, um, like, to define your own idea of success is really important to take time to um, understand what you really want after the PhD. Because, as everyone said, your PhD is not only research. It may feel like that, but at the end of the day, you can have so many other opportunities uh, uh, throughout uh, your academic pathway that um, it is very important to first understand your idea of success to then. Uh, um, create your own opportunities uh, so that you can uh, uh, create those skills uh, for your future. Um, I hope that you found this discussion helpful and uh, will be able to form your own success criteria after today and strive towards achieving that. Before passing over to Leona for the Q&A, I'd like to thank the panelists again and uh, wish you and the audience good luck with your future endeavors. And uh, looking forward to hearing the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, over to our question moderator, Leona Ugeni. Um, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists for sharing your thoughts today. Um, for me, one of I know obviously COVID-19 has had a lot of negative impacts on everyone, but one of the benefits has been the chance to slow down and be self-reflective and ask myself questions like this, like what does success actually mean to me? So there was a lot of information that was given out today by the panellists, but I would encourage everyone in the audience, if they have time, to just sit down sometime and think to yourself, what does success mean to you? Um, I'll move on to the Q&A now. So is, this is the chance for the audience really to ask your questions. And um, you can do that either by sending them in the chat. Um, I think that's actually probably the easiest way. So if you, if you type your questions in the chat box, I will start, um, I will start reading them out. Um, but while I wait for people to have a chance to start sending some questions in, I'll kick us off with a question. Um, clearly today we have an all female panel. Um, so one question I'd like to ask you guys is, um, do, do you think the bar for success is equal uh, between men and women for those wanting to pursue a career in academia? Or do you think there are some differences there? I don't know if anyone would like to answer. I, I could kick off if you like. I think um, it, it depends what you mean by bar. I think I think it's equal in terms of what definition of success I think it would be maybe different for for gender but it'd be different for individual um, I remember reading a book um, called Eve on Top and it was a qualitative discussion about and it was uh, I think there were 16 females in, in top sort of government positions such as vice chancellor of the university or director of chief of police or something like that um, and it was interesting in terms of the perception of success and what that means for all the um, motivating and, and um, uh, influencing other people. And I remember there was one there was one lady who said, in terms of success, she there was a, there was a, can't have been at university because there was a car allowance. You don't get a car allowance with the university salary. <laughs> and the the lady had chosen to buy I don't know a Ford, I don't know Focus or something like that. And there was a male um, colleague that said, "What are you doing driving that car?" Um, you need to be driving, you know, a, a fancy car, you know, a Mercedes or whatever, whatever it is, you know. Um, and she said, well, no, that that for me wasn't success. You know, having that um, capital, you know, um, show of of financial success wasn't her idea of success. It, it, it was not necessarily traditionally male, but for that male person that said that they would look to see that person successful because they are driving that car. And so the 
I don't believe the bar is there in terms of what you define success is, but I think it is, it's different for everyone. I think there are differences in gender in terms of generally, if I'm going to be stereotypical of what that looks like and that awareness and what I was saying before in the discussion, having an awareness of what motivates all the people, whether you're, you know, whatever background you come from is really important because it differs. Is anyone else able to offer an answer or have I silenced you with the question? <laughs> I think um, I think that if I'm understanding right, you're sort of meaning, a kind of meaning like to get to the same level, is it the same? Yeah. I'd say that bar is really the same for everybody, um, but what you want outside of work can influence and who you are influences how any extra challenges that you might have for that which might not necessarily be to do with being male or female that can be to do with anything really you know um caring duties if you want a family or don't want a family um if you have mental health issues or health issues of any sort um all of these sort of edi issues i, I guess all play into it but i think the bar is is the same okay really well, we have some questions from the audience now, so I'll, I'll kick off with some of these. Um, one of the first questions we have is, would you mind, oh, how hard is it to succeed with caring responsibilities? For example, being a mother or having multiple kids whilst doing your PhD? I know, well, I don't want to keep answering. I know Alison, and I don't know about Rosie, we, we, we've both got children. I didn't have children when I was doing my PhD, but I had an academic career while I've had children. Um, it's a juggling act as it would be with any career. And again, those ideas of success, you know, for some people it's, it's. Um, I remember when I, one of the bit you get bits of advice, don't you, at different stages of life, somebody advised me when um, I got my, chair or when I had my first child they said oh get, get a nanny uh, that's really going to help and I thought I, I, I personally don't want a nanny I want to be you know there with, with the kids and doing that and I thought well that, that wasn't for me but it is is right for other people and so that that differs and and um, there's always a, a bit of a guilt I think that I have with you know maybe I should have been more with the children and um, then more with the work but I think you know we we can do it hopefully after <laughs> I think there's guilt whatever way you go <laughs> yeah I, I'm the complete opposite so I didn't do I didn't have children during my PhD I don't know anyone that has so I couldn't give any opinion on that um I had my first child and then decided to stop work completely and just be at home and have another child um and I also felt guilt all that time that I had all this education and I wasn't using it for anything um you know it's a personal choice it's um nobody else can really tell you what to do with that you have to make your own decisions and I think also when you have children um you can't necessarily know how you're going to feel about things like getting a nanny or you know working full-time or working part-time or not working at all or how you're going to cope with having a baby and trying to do a PhD you can't know um because it's different for everybody um, and you know pregnancy and all of it is different for everybody so uh, you just have to figure it out I think <laughs> as you go. Um, I don't have children so I can't comment as such but I know that in the group that I work in people do have kids and I know that if we are ever celebrating a success or anything like that we always try to include them by doing things during the day so that they can join in so as to make sure that they don't feel like they miss out and things like that and academia is also brilliant in the terms of it being flexible so you'll always have the opportunity to work from home or sort of choose your hours a bit more so I guess that makes it a little bit easier in that sense as well. well thanks guys I hope that person feels the um the question was answered there. We've got some more questions. One is from a first year PhD student and they've said, how can we keep ourselves motivated reading more and more research papers? And I'd definitely be interested in this answer. <laughs> um, one of the ways that our group 
um, helps keep motivated the reading papers is we do journal group, group, journal clubs. Um, this is quite a good way to keep on top of reading and to keep people motivated, not only in your specific PhD subject, but also with what's going on in the lab. So that can be a good way um, to keep motivated. Um, what I did was slightly different. So obviously there's a lot of things out there to read, but I kind of making like a mind map saying, okay, I'm working on this chapter. What I want to look at first, I look at the things that are the most relevant and started feeling like, okay, because I need to, I kind of planning, okay, I want to do this bit of the research this week or this month. And I have that kind of planning. So every day I know that, okay, this month I have this, plan to read about, let's say I wanted to read about coding uh, employment variables. And I always focus on that, that part that give me like a tick. So it feel like, okay, I did something. It's just because it's, there's so many things going on with the PhD and most of the time we lose track of what we have done and we feel like we haven't done anything. And that is the main reason why people feel very demotivated about doing these things because they don't see the results. It's feel like, what I what I have done and what, what, what that do for my PhD. So I think it's, it's maybe easier to break it down a little bit rather than having a millions of papers. You can look for, even with one keyword, you have millions of hits on Google Scholar and that's not gonna help. So I could just say, start with one very, very key paper and looking into, looking backwards or forward to see what are the closest papers around that topic. And among those pick the most important one that you want to do in that certain times that could help with planning, obviously, and you will see the result. And the moment you see the result, you have a bit more you know, initiation and, and motivation to continue with that. That would be my advice. I can add to that a little bit, Leona, as well. I totally agree with those answers. I think you uh, need to break it down and focus it a little bit more. And I think the motivation for reading it, if you're, if you're just reading for reading's sake it's really hard that it's going to be really overwhelming and, and one would i would procrastinate over that um unless you see you know some key ones that is really really relevant to your research and then that's very exciting but if you're in your first year phd and you're trying to uh, gain a plethora of information you need to have so you might be writing a literature review but it might also be nice to publish you know a short term communication review or something like that. if you've got an aim and then a focus on that review then that narrows it down and you've got a bit more of a purpose and then you can go right these are the key words I need to search for this is going to be as Anne said this particular section and and then you can compartmentalize it and then you can break that down even further and say right I'll have finished that section by this week I would also say don't just read have other things you're doing at the same time again you'll go a little bit stir crazy probably if all you're doing is reading the papers um, so do try and, and break up. I know it's difficult. It has been difficult with COVID, with the labs closed if you can't get in. Um, but you can do all the projects like this, like um, outreach and things like that at the same time to break up your day. Um, if you can try, and it doesn't always work for, for some people. I know some of my colleagues have, you know, dedicated, once you're keeping on top of the literature, once you've done your literature review and published that to keep on top, they normally say, right, you know, Friday afternoon, you know, two till three, that's going to be my hour to do a search, have a quick check. Um, and so you could do that as a routine and keep on top. So it's not overwhelming, right? I haven't done it for two months and it's just going to take forever to go through it. And then the last thing is think about how you read in those papers. If you're planning to read each of those papers individually all the way through from the start to finish, that's going to be really hard. I think some of the papers, which are key papers, um, which will influence what you're doing in PhD, you will need to do that. But some of them, you need to have a general awareness of what the key take home message is. Right. And so you'll, you'll read your abstract, you read the, the, the results, the methods and then um, have a look at the results and then just you just highlight key bits. So you don't need to spend ages on each paper. You need to get the key, key take home message. Right. What's important for me to learn from that? Is it a technique? Is it an outcome knowing that this is the time frame for a particular gene to be upregulated or whatever it is? And then you make a note of that and that goes into a lit review or chapter, what have you. Oh, thank you. Lots of useful tips there. I'm just going to move us on because there are actually quite a few questions in the chat. I know we've only got uh, 15 minutes or so left. But the, the next question is, 
Um, any suggestions for introverts, those who feel nervous to talk or present themselves uh, for being successful during their PhD? So maybe more specifically success with presenting uh, for those who are, who are introverted. Um, practice is probably the best thing that you can do for that. Um, if you know you've got to go and give a presentation at a conference, have a practice run just with your group that you know, um, and, and do try and ask for feedback, which I know is hard if you're introverted and you're really conscious of giving the presentation. But if you're going to get feedback, it's better to get it from people that you know when you can still make some changes and then um, give a presentation at the conference. Um, the first time I presented at a conference, I remember sitting through the first day of presentations and thinking, well, I can do better than that. <laughs> and that kind of helped, actually, because some people are, are not very good at presenting, but you're probably, if you get some advice and if you think about making the slides nice and telling a story, um, then, you know, you can you can do it and try and enjoy it if you can. I can just add to that. I, I, I totally agree with what Alison's um, uh, said. I think practice really, really does help. Um, there are some quite, I'll, I'll try and do a quick search for TED Talks. There's a really good TED Talks on, on that sort of confidence building and some really key techniques you can do before you would go on and, and present. If, it, if it's presenting, that's, that, that's an issue. So, you know, controlling your breathing, um, you know, power poses, and it really does make a difference. You can, you can go to the, the, the cubicles before toilets or something and then do this kind of power. You just feel better afterwards and you can go in and, and, and more confident you can tackle the situation. And also sometimes pretending to, to be someone. I remember when I was, um, you know, some, when I was uh, starting out on my uh, career and presenting, I was, really, uh, you know, really nervous beforehand. And I remember thinking, I remember, I, I won't say who it is, but there's somebody who I really, I still do really respect a brilliant presenting. I remember thinking, I'm gonna, I don't, I know I just have to be like me. I don't have to be that person, but I'm just gonna be present, pretend to that person. Well, how would they do it right I'll just so I don't have to be me I'll just put myself in somebody else's position and then I thought oh well therefore it it just it just helped in terms of confidence I think it, it depends what you mean by introvert as well so if it's you know I see introvert as more I think I'm more of an introvert and I don't I you know I enjoy socializing but I don't get energy from socializing um, so I feel quite drained after, you know a networking event I'll have to go away and be by myself and get my energy back and so one doesn't have to necessarily get energy from it and again practice it you know you can still enjoy it um so i agree with sarah that um trying to think of somebody else that you know that is really good at it that's something i've done before as well and it really does make a big difference if you're nervous about any situation as well not just presenting but like sarah said going to any sort of networking events or anything where you're unsure that that kind of thing does help yeah and also you can remember that at these events if you're networking and things um you've all got something in common and that's your research so if you're worried about what to talk about just ask someone about their research and you'll find that they'll chat away and you probably don't have to say too much okay. which is quite a good thing to do okay, so another question in the chat um this question says how do you balance your phd and looking for job job opportunities during the final year of your phd do you have any suggestions for that? Um, let me start with this one. Uh, I actually didn't apply for a job in my final year. I started way later than that. My first job was in halfway through my first year. So that was the first teaching job I got outside my department. I just think that it's better to start earlier so you learn along the way. And by the time you reach the point where you definitely need a job, you're already prepared. You may have a lot of failure along the way, get a lot of rejections, but it's better to start earlier. I start um, my, like the main job application start in my third year and I'm in my fourth year now. So to balance time really, again, is coming down to planning. So I have a plan. I always have a very massive Excel file where I search for company, what are the deadlines, what are the job I want. And that has been done a bit earlier. So I know approximately when I need to look into a certain company in certain positions and get ready for all these things. So for job application, it definitely need a lot of planning and you need to have a tracker to know what you have applied, what you 
um, whether you have heard from them or not, because you will get lost in so many applications along with your PhD. Uh, another thing is I try to block a certain time during the day or during the week, like saying I will have to do all the PhD related work from Monday to Thursday. And then Friday, I will just sit down and focus on looking at my applications, um, seeing how far my application has got to and these kind of things. So it's me a bit more like you cannot have everything hanging around because in the end you, you won't be able to do anything. You need to have a certain block of time for certain things and look into that. I know that it's very stressful when you're in final year and applying for job and then seeing your confidence hit the ground, getting emails saying, yeah, we won't process or things like that. But let's just move on. Anything that is not life-threatening has nothing to do with you. So you will get a, some emails saying that they won't process. It not necessarily mean you are not good. It could be that you already have, they already have someone from internal or they already have uh, someone to fill in the person and they just open that because they have to. So don't get dragged into those uh, rejection email. It's good to learn from that if they provide any feedback. Otherwise, just move on because that's a waste of time if you just stay there looking at the email or any rejection feeling like something not good about you. It's good to learn, but it's good to move on as well. So that, that's how I did it. Um, yeah, I think that's that probably the main thing planning is the is the best ways to do it. Um, I guess I could also add it's really clear to be in communication with your supervisor and clear with yourself because for a lot of jobs you will have needed to have written your thesis, just submitted your thesis and be at a point where you can move on. So to have a clear idea of when you're going to have finished writing or have submitted um, is also good before you get yourself bogged down in applications or turning up at interviews and then promising something that you perhaps can't deliver is also quite important to bear in mind. Um, another question uh, kind of linked to what Anne was just talking about there about the rejection of, of papers or applications. Someone has asked, how can they pre prevent themselves from losing, from losing confidence after their paper has been rejected um, several times? Um, you've, you've got to be really thick skinned, <clears throat> I think, when you submit because um, you're, you're putting out your best work and people are reviewing it and uh, it's not even a face to face. So there are going to be some harsh comments coming back. The editor should make sure that they're not rude, <laughs> but even so, um, they can be a bit soul destroying, particularly if it's your first one and then you start doubting, is it me? Um, but I can I reassure you, everybody gets these comments. I still get these comments about my papers and you have to see it as um, not personal and actually to, to learn from it. Now, if you've had several comments back, you have to make sure you're reviewing every time you get a set of comments. So if you've had a set of comments and you've ignored them and they resubmitted the same paper and you're getting similar comments back, that probably isn't a good thing to do, right? But if you're taking on board those comments each time, what I would say is then take go through Obviously, I presume you've spoken to your supervisor about it already. There is a bigger network. We've been talking about mentors. Or you've, you've got other people, academics you can talk to. Go and seek advice and say, what is it that's not going right? You, you should know from the comments that are coming back. It might be that you need another bit of an experimentation to go in it. It might be that your um, overall key take home message is not clear and it needs a bit of a rewrite and you need maybe uh, the discussion. Maybe the quality of your figures aren't right, um, but looking specifically at that and getting feedback from the reviewers' comments coming back, but also with your colleagues. Um, I just reassure you, you wouldn't be doing the PhD, you wouldn't be on the PhD programme if you were not good enough. OK, so just remember that. And it's, so it's not you. You will get there. Just just keep at it. You know, I still submit things, grants and papers that get rejected. Um, but it's you know, you just got to keep going. It's part of the course. OK, I'll move on to another question. Um, this is from another first year PhD student who's doing a lab based project. And they've said that they know um, having small goals can help them manage their time better, but they also feel like a failure when they can't achieve these goals. So what is your advice for goal setting um, and, and dealing with 
with not meeting uh, short objectives in the lab-based project. Um, maybe reassess what the goals are that you're setting, um, if you're making them too big, um, if you're going into the lab and you're doing the experiments, you know, you're doing the work, you're not sitting around watching TV. So don't feel too bad. Things don't always work. Um, look at what's going wrong. Speak again. Communication. So speak to your supervisor about it. Um, I'd say especially if you're feeling demotivated, it's always good to work to have a chat with your supervisor and um, and tell them how you're feeling. I, I mean, I would agree with Alison's comments. It sounds like, and it's hard to, you know, without having looking at the details, do discuss again, either with your supervisor or your mentors, or just speak to people, because you've got a network there. People, other people are probably in exactly the same position and it will just probably reassure you, make you feel better to know that it's normal. And um, it sounds like that you might have too many goals. So you might need to reassess what's realistic. If you're constantly setting a lot of goals and not getting through them, um, then you're setting too many. And, that, and then you learn from that and say, instead of doing 10 things in one day, you'll just do three and, what, and prioritize what are those three. And then hopefully at the end of the day, you'll go, right, I did all that, brilliant, I've, I've, I've done that. And I think, you know, what Anne was saying, you know, every probably every six months or every year, you reevaluate where you want to go. You need to make sure that each of those small goals your aims that you're doing for your day align to that overall goal because actually if the tasks that you're setting yourself don't align to your success motivation then you're always going to feel that you haven't quite achieved and so you do need to sit back and reflect and go am I enjoying this is this getting me where I want to be um, and if that's not aligned then then you need to probably rethink what those goals are that you're setting yourself okay well, I know, I know there are a few more questions in the chat that have been sent to me privately. Unfortunately, I won't be able to ask them today. Um, so I'll, I'll close the Q&A there. Thank you, everyone. To, thank you to everyone who sent in some questions. And I'll hand over to Rob now, who'll close the webinar for today. So over to Rob. Thanks, Leona. Thanks for leading the Q&A. And thank you, everyone, for staying for the duration. Um, I've put a link to a survey in the chat and we would greatly appreciate you filling that out as it will aid us with our future topics and making future webinars even better. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, thank you everyone for your participation and to our panel, uh, Sarah, Rosemary, Alison and Anne uh, for speaking with us and sharing your thoughts. And also a big thank you uh, to the CDT uh, for giving us a chance to create PhD Discuss and to all the staff members at the universities of Manchester and Sheffield who are uh, able to promote the event for us. I'm going to share our social media details um, on, on screen here. Um, please consider uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see the recording of this uh, once we've edited it. And also, if you want to get in contact with us or share the event, then we have um, all of these social media plugs here. Um, so thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you in the next webinar. Um, so and have a very nice evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.